Today is February 10th, 2011. My name is Emily Schuster. This interview with Ina Schneiden is being filmed for the Maria Rogers Oral History Program and is being filmed by Brandon Springer. So, Ina, today um, our first question for you is when and where were you born? I was born in Moscow in 1968. Okay. Um, would you like to tell us a little about your, your childhood, your, your life there? and? Um, Mm. You know, <laughs> it was so long ago. Do you have like any specific question? I mean, childhood is kind of a long period yeah. of time to put it into sentences. Sure. So <laughs> I mean, well, if you have any specific stories in mind that are particularly memorable, or um, or you can speak generally if you'd like. Maybe what was elementary school like? In the elementary school. Well, the thing is that the school I went, it was from first to tenth grade, and majority of schools were like this. Mm -hmm. And um, all this time we lived. Uh, my parents got divorced right before I, uh, grade, uh, right before I went to first grade. So the summer before first grade, my mom and me, and my little sister, we moved to to my grandma. Mm -hmm. where I started school and uh, where I graduated, we didn't yeah. move around Moscow. And this was also in Moscow, she Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, city. I for 24 years I lived in Moscow and mm -hmm. then I came to Colorado. Okay. Didn't move too much. Yeah. Um, and did you like school as a kid? Or no, I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, and there, are, there were a few reasons. First was that, um, and I know it sounds terrible, and uh, uh, probably if I would grow up here, I would never say it, but forgive me, I grew up there. The district I grew up was uh, absorbed by Moscow. It used to be a small city, and it was absorbed by Moscow not too long before we moved there. So the majority of people who lived there, they were like factory workers in this area, uh, not too educated, so it's not like my family was the only educated one, mm -hmm. but definitely we were in minority. So the kids who I went to school with, they were very different from what I got to got used to in my family. And um, for ten years in school, I didn't have friends there, and I was only Jewish kid in my class and in. Uh, uh, in schools back then, I don't know how it is now, but in schools back then, you have a uh, set-up group of kids. Well, the same as elementary school mm -hmm. here, you have a set group of, group of kids in one class. The only difference is that you are with these kids, for mo with most of them, mm -hmm. through your, through the time when you graduate. Because it's all one school. Yeah, right. it's, uh, you know, and uh, you all take the same classes, mm -hmm. the same subjects and stuff. So um, I was the only Jewish kid there till I believe nine, ninth or eight, ninth grade mm -hmm. when uh, they, uh, because lots of kids left after eighth grade to go to technical schools. So they didn't have enough kids to fill up three classes mm -hmm. and they put one just in two classes. So another two Jewish girls from another class joined me. So there were three of us out of like 35. Mm -hmm. Did you interact with the other two Jewish girls? Were you close? I'm sorry? Were you friends with the other two Jewish girls? No. No? No, because by that time I had my friends. They were outside of school. We all lived in different parts of Moscow, but they were friends. Mm -hmm. So, um, though... Actually, the funny thing is that we went to, uh, <laughs> we went to Israel two years ago, a year and a half ago, and um, there is this big Russian Oh, not Russian, not Russian, you can call it whatever. Um, network uh, where you can find your classmates. It's like website, mm -hmm. yeah. It's uh, quite popular, I'm sure there are tons of them, but this one got very popular. And um, just out of curiosity, I registered there and found a few kids. And um, uh, one of the girl, another Jewish girl, she lived in Israel. And, you know, we exchanged a couple emails. Uh, it turned out that our kids about the same size, well, the same age. <laughs> <laughs> the same age, uh, probably the same size. <laughs> and uh, she also has two boys. And we, uh, we started about meeting when we were in Israel, but then 
when we got there and I called her, I wasn't sure that I want to meet and it was obvious that she wasn't going to drive for an hour and a half to meet me and you mm -hmm. know, that's the thing is that, you know, with childhood friends, if you can live for 20 years without them, you probably can make another 40 without them. Mm -hmm. um, so that you hadn't been in touch? Since, well, since you know, young, like I, I would put a new picture there, and she would maybe comment on it. Okay. And if I see that, uh, if the ad pops up that her birthday is coming, if I don't forget, I may say happy birthday. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that you were the only Jewish kid in your school, and I'm curious, when did you first realize you were Jewish? When I was called Jew. When you were called Jew? By who? Uh, by my classmates. And that was the first time. You yes. So were your parents, uh, did they practice? Um, no. Did, did no. they speak Hebrew or Yiddish? No. no. My, um, well, about Hebrew and Yiddish, my grand-grandfather grand was a consultant for Lenin's library. It's like the biggest library in Soviet Union. He was consulted the, consulting there. He was doing consulting for them on Hebrew literature but he was gone way before I was born. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, he, he knew Yiddish because he grew up in little Jewish village. And uh, he, uh, I'm not sure he knew Hebrew to tell you the truth because I have, I brought it here, I have uh, Russian Hebrew dictionary mm -hmm. that was one time it was published in Soviet Union it belongs to him, but I don't know did he is, did he actually know the language or not. Mm -hmm. And my grand grandmother and my grandma they knew Yiddish, but they you and probably my mom even knew a little bit. Well, she forgot it now, but maybe she did. But they use it as secret language. So they had no yeah. desire to teach me or my sister. Uh -huh. So like when the parents didn't want yes, the kids exactly. to know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And my grand grandma, she was probably the only one who who was practicing Judaism. So I know that she had prayer books and she would read them. So obviously she could read Hebrew, but I don't know how much she understood mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not sure she could speak. Okay. Um, so you would say that your family, though they identified as Jewish, they were, or how observant were you of, of holidays, or, or was it more? Uh, I was actually. Uh, the thing is that when I was in sixth grade, I joined. I joined this club. It's called Art History Club at the uh, Moscow Museum of Fine Arts, and it just turned out that in my group. 80%, 85% of kids were Jewish. And um, once somebody said, I don't remember, probably it was eighth grade or something, somebody said, why don't you go to synagogue? Yeah, hell, why don't you go to synagogue? <laughs> and uh, the thing that it was fun, no, none of us did it before, and it was kind of a feel of danger, because mm. we know that if we do it, uh, and somebody would know about it, we would be in trouble, and parents could be in trouble and such. Yeah. So we decided, yeah, let's go. And from eighth grade till 10th grade, middle of 10th grade, because we got cut. Uh, we went there almost every holiday and almost every Saturday, but to tell you the truth, it wasn't too much of a <laughs> synagogue. It was because I don't even think they wanted us inside, but it was a huge group, like, there were hundreds of people on holidays, and uh, they were dancing and singing, and girls were meeting boys, boys were meeting girls, moms were trying to find girls for their sons, mm -hmm. and you know, it was kind of socializing, and uh, it was interesting, and it was kind of, you know, this kind of adrenaline rise when we would live, it was, um, Nagin Square was the underground station where mm. you had to get to get there. And on the big Jewish holidays, you could see the guys who were standing there and just watching who is going. Mm. So wow. just passing by them, it was kind of, you know, a little over adrenaline was jumping into your blood. Yeah. 
Um, uh, so, uh, after my grand grandma died, um, I kind of, I wouldn't say that I started to practice, but I was the one who would go to synagogue before Passover and get matzo for everybody in the family, and uh, we would mail it to Kiev, for example. So, you felt compelled to practice a little bit? Um, I did, probably, just a little bit. But it was mostly as, how do you say, to do something against the country I was living. Mm. It was not too much as identify myself as Jewish. It was more with feeling, well, you don't want me, and I don't want you either. Mm. So it was like an act of rebellion. Kind of, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said you got caught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little more about that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I don't remember what was it, Passover or what holiday it was, but by that time uh, it was like kind of permanent group of my friends who would go there. Uh, like boys, girls, you know, little romance here, there. And it was one holiday, I don't remember what it was, but Obviously, it wasn't the biggest one because it would never happen at the big one. Uh, but uh, me and my friend, we didn't go for whatever reason, but the boys went. And uh, what happened, what I learned later, no, what was it? No, we learned about it. Yes, we learned. And next Saturday, after the holiday, we went there. But what happened is that one of them, and it was 1984, uh, one of the boys, somehow, I don't know where he managed to get it, uh, when the people were dancing, he got out the little Israeli flags, flag and started to wave it around. Yeah. Wasn't the smartest thing to do. Uh, and um, so they, they took him and his friends to the nearest uh, militia, like police station. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were police, there were government. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were like around to actually yeah. get to this uh, group of people. You had to go through them. And yeah, the funny wow. thing is that they would always dress the same. I mean, you could spot them immediately. So they were attempting to be undercover, right? Or Well, I don't know. They didn't really blend in. Huh. They all were dressed the same. They, I would even say they looked the same. They were not you in a uniform, like police, mm -hmm. but they all were wearing this beige colored, um, at least in winter, not in winter, but in uh, spring and fall, it was this uh, beige colored raincoats. Mm -hmm. And when you see like, you know, 10 people in the same coats, you kind of get an idea that it can be just an accident. Yeah. So, the, him and uh, other friend, I believe just one friend, got caught and they were taken to the police station and um, uh, they were questioned and they were told that if you don't stop doing it, if you don't stop coming there, they would never get to any university, never, uh, no institute, institute is like college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would never make it to any college or any university, and their parents would have uh, would get in trouble. And uh, it was more dangerous for boys than for girls because if boy doesn't make it to the army on the first year after school, mm -hmm. he goes to the army. And Afghanistan wasn't full blown back then, so this boys absolutely yeah. they understood what was going on. So. But, so, next Saturday, me and my friend, we both, what, 16, 17, two girls, you know, um, we decided to go there, because for us, we were not there, and for us, it all sounded like, wow, it's like, a, if not a joke, but something like an adventure. So, we were going there, and we found one of the boys there. I don't know what he was thinking about. Maybe he was not going to university or whatever. So we found him there, and you're like, oh, hey, George. So what happened? Tell us, tell us. And he was like, and he kind of waved us off. Like, not rude, but he didn't want to talk to us or something. So like, okay, we looked around, not too many people. We saw everybody we wanted to see, and we started to go back. And this street, it's called um, Arhipova Street. 
it goes pretty, uh, like a pretty st deep, um, steep hill. Mm -hmm. And the synagogue is on the like, uh, last two blocks from the bottom. Mm -hmm. And we started to walk up there. And when we were on the middle of this hill, we, co we could hear girls, girls, wait. You know, we're just 16 years old. So we were just 16 years old. So we stopped and one of those beige raincoats came and he was like, uh, what are your names? And, but he knew who he was. He said, what's the matter? Well, maybe I want, you know, to date one of you. Well, we don't, we are not interested. Well, I'm from police. I need your passports. I, you know, I still could remember my heart going like, pew, 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 pew. But my friend, obviously, she was a little bit uh, braver, a little bit smarter. She said, we don't have passports. The rule was kind of that you have to carry passports with you. But it wasn't enough uh, of a, you know, crime to get us arrested or anything. So we don't have passport. I don't know, was he going to take us to the police station or was not, but it was our other friend who was coming. And even she was um, our age, but she was very beautiful. And lo at her 16 years of age, she looked probably like 20, 22. So she kind of looked at us, then a second look and came close and she asked, what's the matter? And he definitely didn't want another, another girl in this group and he said well I'm letting you go this time or oh, he said I want them to come with me and she said they're not going anywhere with you well, what are you talking about and he said well I let you go this time but I don't want to see you here anymore and it was enough for us not to come there for another mm -hmm. half a year yeah <laughs> it was it was pretty scary because for a couple months after that and of course I was a Kamsamol member and she was a Kamsamol member and we were going to, you know, to try to university after that. So uh, I remember that every time in school we had, how do you call it? Like when the principal want to speak to the whole school, loud, uh, loud announcement, speak, announcement, announcement yeah. yeah. <laughs> and before every announcement for the whole school, it was this beep sound. And I remember for two months after that, I was kind of shaken after every beep sound because I was afraid that I would be called to the principal <laughs> on this matter. He asked you for your passports. Why? Why would you not want to see your passport? Well, because if he would have my passport, he would know my name. He would know where I live. It would be easy, very easy to find my parents. And you know, the thing is that as soon as we handle him our passports, he could simply take them, and then we would be forced to come with him. And did it list your nationality in your passport? Oh yeah, as, mm -hmm. as a Jew. Yeah. Um, so this was this specific event happened while you were still in high school. Uh -huh. Yes. So um, and after high school, and you said you you were attempting to apply to to colleges to university. Did you did you end up applying? Did you end up attending while you were still? Uh, yes, training? actually, yes. I went to uh, the first year. I tried to go to um, how do you go? Well, now it is online. A oh, correspondence um, mm -hmm. in uh, okay. So first year I tried to make to correspondence law school in Moscow, but didn't make it because they require experience. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, not correspondence, but evening, evening law school. Yeah. I knew that I wouldn't make it to university law school, um, just didn't feel comfortable. Yeah. But uh, this one I decided to try and um, so first year I didn't make it because they said we simply require experience. And I went to work for some trade, I don't know whatever it's called, but like a big organization that supplied restaurants in Moscow with like furniture and stuff. They had their law department and mm -hmm. they needed the intern without any education, you know, some paper pusher. But it still would count as a, they would give me title of a law assistant. Mm -hmm. So when I would uh, apply to university or to this college, yes. I would rightfully put, 
lawyer assistant or paralegal, whatever it would be, yeah. and uh, it would count as an experience. So I worked there for a year and then I applied to school and was admitted. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess something we haven't really touched on about your, your youth uh -huh. <laughs> was um, your family and, and were, they, were they always very supportive of your education? Um, like how did they education just in, in general, general? Oh or yes, specifically. Yes, there were mm -hmm. um, any stories about. Um, well, you know, that's another thing. Is that as long as I remember, my grandma and my mom would always tell me that uh, if I if my grades wouldn't be too good of mm -hmm. school, they would always say you're Jewish. You have to be better because <laughs> to yeah. reach the same goal, you have to work harder because you you have this and people would look at it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, you said you were 24 mm -hmm. when you came to this country. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine there, um, or I guess just how did that process come about? What, you know? Why did we come? Why what? did you come and, and how did you get here? And um, well, my, there, that's a my complicated question. I'm father's, sure. my father's sister and her family immigrated to uh, U.S. in 1979, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of under the sea. Uh, it was like a secret in the family. Like me and my sister, they were not supposed to know where they live because uh, parents were afraid that we'll tell somebody at school and you know we'll get in trouble and blah blah blah. So we were told that they moved to Siberia. Why somebody would move to Siberia from Moscow? I don't know. <laughs> but we were told they in Siberia. They started to send little souvenirs, so like, you know, like t-shirts, jeans and stuff. And we were told, yes, yes, in Siberia, you could buy it. Wow. Because, you know, the sailors, they come from across the ocean, they sell stuff. Yeah, the climate is bad, but uh, shops, stores are better. Mm. No, we bought it for some time. Then when we will grow up a little bit, probably somewhere in seventh grade or something, the eighth grade, we were allowed to see pictures. And uh, then this, this club that I was talking about, the art club, uh, every child who was there had some family member who immigrated or was going to immigrate. And of course we were teenagers, we thought so much about ourselves, you know, so smart, ready for serious conversations, so we would talk about it. So the, the idea of immigrating wasn't really this uh, foreign, but it never was set up in stone like, well, I grew up, I immigrate. Because, you know, my family didn't immigrate for whatever reason, so. Mm -hmm. But it was in the back of your mind. Yeah, it's kind of, it's a possibility, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I'll ever do it. Yeah. But, uh, and when I started to date my uh, former husband, I, uh, he asked me if I want to immigrate, and I said, I really don't know. It's, uh, mm -hmm. We were going to get married back then, and I said, you know, I think it's something that we would both decide, and if you feel that you would make, it would be better for you to immigrate, I would go with you, because I know that I can live anywhere, really. And he, he said something that, um, well, I think that I can make it okay here. Okay, then we are staying, not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But then his uh, brother uh, came here as, um, they didn't immigrate, they came here to work on a contract for CU in Boulder. Mm -hmm. To teach? Uh, right. No, he was professor assistant or assistant professor, okay. what is the, the low one, whatever it is. Uh, he, was, he was very young when he came. So him and his family, family came here and then the communism fall. What, in my humble opinion, is a perfect thing. But it brought everything with it. And um, I remember, like anywhere you want to go, Moscow is a huge city, so anywhere you want to go, you have to take underground. And um, I was, uh, uh, to get to my uni uni college, I was supposed to change to trains and to make a long walk, it's like a huge, I believe it was the longest uh, hallway in Moscow back then for underground. And it was this um, 
So, you know, just big hall with white and black tiles on walls. Lots of people all the time because it was right in downtown Moscow. And uh, they were, at some point, always, whenever I would go there, it was this group called Pamit, uh, Memory. Uh, I don't know, do they call themselves uh, themselves fascists or whatever the hell they want to call themselves, but they were Russian nationalists. So Russia for Russians, kill the Jews, you know, all this kind of junk. And so they had all their posters on this wall. And there were this uh, young man uh, standing in their black long coach. Very, very friendly to talk to anybody who would want to talk to them, explain what they believe in and stuff. And I was just, you know, a little 20 years old girl who didn't really feel comfortable crossing this uh, Call every day even they never you know like tell me anything or try to talk to me or never but it doesn't make you feel really comfortable and really safe yeah this is this hallway this is in the, the subway station in subway station okay. yes and uh, you know and then I uh, there were rumors about pogrom in Moscow and it's funny because I was pregnant with my first child yeah, it's kind of funny, interesting to put pogrom and funny in the same sentence, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was pregnant with my first child and uh, quite pregnant. Uh, I was on my like eight or seventh month. So everything I, I hear on TV, everything I hear on the radio, if it doesn't affect me to the way I start crying, it goes <laughs> right through. <laughs> so I forgot about everything. And uh, my uh, husband back then, he was lecturing a lot. And he would lecture in Moscow, he would go to uh, Kiev, he would go somewhere else. So it was one of these days when he was out of the out of city, I was alone. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, uh, around five o'clock, my brother-in-law came. And you know, he stayed with me, we had like tea, we chat. And he stayed for two hours. It never happened before. And I was kind of curious, why did he come? What, what was the occasion? Like, if he just simply wanted to check on me, he could grab the phone. He stayed for a couple hours, I left. Only later I learned that the rumors were that that was the day when pogrom was going to happen. So he just came there just, you know, to be with me. But he never, he will never mention it, you know, it was just a very, just simple relative visit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then later in one of the magazines, the ones that uh, uh, I respected, I read that, I don't remember who was the author of the article, but she said that she was talking about these rumors and she said that it really doesn't matter if pogrom happens or doesn't. It doesn't even matter if pogrom happens and nobody you know got killed. It doesn't really matter if somebody gets killed or was one person killed or hundreds were killed. The only thing that matters is that there is a possibility for it to happen. And you know, after I read it, I was like, that's exactly it. You know, I simply don't want to live in a situation where the possibility of pogrom would always be on my mind. Even somewhere deep on the background, but I would know that there is no guarantee that it's not going to happen. And I definitely don't want to raise kids. And you know, and back up, and you know, after you kind of decide this, you start coming up with the things, well, maybe I don't want my kids to grow up and, call, and be called Jew in school. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this was the the thought process before you That was the thought to process. Then my husband was uh, quite successful in Russia. And what did he teach or what was he lecturing uh, on? It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, he, he taught astrology. Astrology. Okay. And uh, he, uh, it was his hobby and it turned out lots of other people had the same hobby so they wanted to learn and he had this hobby for a long time. So anyway, he uh, so he was able to teach. And uh, it so he was successful. They had their show on TV, like a little uh, 15 minutes every day. 
and uh, one day he told me, you know, if somebody calls you, of course there were no cell phones, right? So uh, one day he tells me, you know, if somebody calls you and tells you to come somewhere because I asked you to, just take the child and go to my parents. Not even to your parents because they live in Moscow. Go to my parents, they live like outside of Moscow. Just go there, but don't come. You know, it never happened. Doesn't make you feel safe. And um, uh, after that, he started, I, you know, I don't really know because he was the, the one who made decision that we immigrated. By the time we immigrated, I had two babies, like one was year and a half, no, two years old, another one was half year old. I really didn't bother with the thoughts of how we are going to uh, establish our life in five years from now. I was too busy with kids. So he decided we're immigrating. Okay, we're immigrating. And, um, but I really don't know what actually pushed him to this. Maybe the same thoughts that I was having. Maybe the feeling of being successful is not too safe in Moscow. Maybe he was just seeing how his brother is living here. And back then, a few other relatives of his moved too. But he made decision. His parents decided they're going to immigrate. And they just did. And you, um, and you applied for a visa? Um, well, it was it was more complicated. It was a, more complicated yeah. because years before that, yes, like ten years before we applied, you had to. The thing is that you had to apply for the Russian government to be able to leave the country, to be allowed to leave the country, and then another country, whichever another country is, had to say yes, we are willing to take you. So we applied to be able to leave without uh, knowing where would we go. Uh, I was agreed to go to US and Israel, but didn't want to go to Germany. He was agreed to go to Germany and US, but didn't want to go to Israel. So uh, we applied without knowing where we actually going, we applied to, for the permission to leave the country. And uh, I was allowed, but he was not. Because 10 years before he worked on, I believe, lasers or something that was military connected. And after that, it all started, like we got a lawyer, uh, his brother here um, co connected to Bill Cohen. And uh, so it started. And, by the time when, and my, um, my husband applied to, not applied, but he pressed charges. He was the first one who did it. Um, he pressed charges against uh, Soviet, or whatever it was. It was still Soviet Union. He pressed charges against, against Soviet Union government for not allowing, allowing him to leave the country. And it was already when uh, the communist fall, and judge didn't know what to, not the judge, but the clerk in the court office, they didn't know what to do because nobody uh, pressed the charges against the government before, but he had no reason not to take the papers. So the court, uh, this whole matter was going for a long time and by the time we were allowed to leave the country, and he was allowed to leave the country, we already had the papers from uh, U.S. that they're ready to take us. So this is my grandmother. This picture is made in, uh, was taken in Australia, in Brisbane, and I believe she's four years old here. So must be somewhere around 1917, somewhere from 1916 to 1918. So, so she was born in 1904, so it was like 1918. Mm -hmm. And um, her father, when he was a teenager, well, around 17 or 18, I believe, he, he and a couple of his friends, they managed on their own money that they would work for during the road. They managed to get from 
either southern, southern Russia or Ukraine uh, through Siberia, through Kuril, through Japan, they managed to get to Australia, to Brisbane, and back then it was a big Russian community. No, it was a community of Russian political uh, immigrants there, and lots of them were Jewish, the whole family, families, and um, he fell in love with one of the girls, and uh, he married her, and uh, my grandmother was born, and when she was uh, four years old, it was after the revolution in Russia, and uh, the big part of this community decided to go back and help to build this heaven on earth. It didn't turn to be heaven for most of them. But, but this, the interesting thing is that lots of them, uh, not lots of them, but some part of them actually stayed in Australia. And my grandma, I remember that she died when I was in ninth grade. Uh, my grandma once told me a story when uh, she was probably in her 20s, uh, one of the, I don't remember, was it a child from this community or was it like, uh, you no, know, he was probably in his uh, like middle age man, like in his 40s or something. He was a singer and he came to give a concert in Moscow as an Australian citizen. And uh, her and her sister, they, they went to the concert and they even wrote him a note, who are they and that they want to meet him. But at the, at the end, they chickened out and left without ever meeting mm. him. But in her passport, she would have Brisbane and it caused her some uncomfortable situations. And once, uh, there were kind of, uh, there were a few situations that she told me about. One was uh, when it was just, when it just said Brisbane, uh, and the, whoever she had to show her passport to, ask her, where is it? And she didn't feel comfortable in like, uh, it was 70s or something, she didn't feel comfortable saying Australia. So she said, oh, it's a little village in Ukraine and it just flew by. Uh, and then it was when uh, she was getting her last passport, I guess she was like uh, 65 years old, the clerk at the office asked her, Brisbane, where is it? And she tried the same trick with, oh, some village in Ukraine. But he looked at her and put it in parentheses, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And uh, so her father immigrated and uh, they lived in, uh, in Ukraine, I, I think it was Ukraine, Ukraine, but uh, when the World War I broke, uh, they, uh, they didn't leave the area because uh, the parents were old and they wouldn't be able to, to transport them mm -hmm. to safety, so they got killed and during the occupation. And my grandma moved to Moscow before that to, to study. And, uh, uh, but when she was in Ukraine, because they were there right during the revolution and they were there during this new economical policy that Lenin, Lenin declared in, I believe it was 1921, and this American uh, company, it's called, I don't know how much of a company, but let's call it company. It's called AgraJoin. It was um, the movement of, uh, not the movement, what, what actually it was is that wealthy American Jewish people gave money to establish these agricultural communities in Soviet Union. Uh, I would think it was something similar to kibbutz in Israel. Mm -hmm. So. My grandma's family were in one of these agro-joint uh, communities and when she was 14 years old she was actually in charge of like I don't know how many people in one of the, I don't know was it the beet field or whatever they were growing there. But then she moved, she moved to Moscow and met my grandfather. Mm. And uh, uh, my grandfather, he 
uh, his family stayed in in Ukraine or so southern Russia. They didn't go anywhere. But his brother, I believe it was it was his uncle or his brother. Wait, you know what? No, I'm lying. It was my father's family who stayed under the occupation. My my mom's family, they survived. They they moved. They moved to. They actually they were in evacuation in uh, one of these eastern republics, either Tajikistan or Turkmenistan, whatever it was. So anyway, my grandfather's family from my mom's side. Uh, his, I believe it was his uncle, his brother, I don't know, who ran to Poland. And when my grandfather was uh, probably in his late teenage years, uh, he also felt like he is ready for some adventures. And um, my sister told me, I didn't know about this, but she, but he actually hid in the hay on a, some, uh, how do you call it? Farm? No, not farm, but uh, these things on wheels, carriages. He he wanted to get away from this village and make it to Poland, but obviously, thank God, he didn't because his father found him, and that saved him. And he um, so he found him and probably beat him up and told him everything he thought about looking for adventures. But my grandpa ran to Moscow, and in Moscow. He went to the school. It was like a school for new diplomats, because the Rush, uh, the communist government was very new. Every uh, professionals they had, majority of them, they, feel they were from the old regime, and they need they need the new professionals. So my grandfather entered this. It was uh, again. It was called a uh, school for new. Oh, young diplomats, I really don't know how to translate it correctly. And it was not in the university, it was like a separated department under the government. And they were, they were studying the different, you know, Soviet Union was the only communist country in the world. So they were studying lots of different uh, political systems, political movement. So when they would actually go to other countries, they would prepare, they would know what is uh, the political regime there, what is the movement, so they would be very well prepared. And one way of doing it was to, um, they had debates, and they would, it was kind of a role play, they would take one of the uh, party, communist party get together, and let's say, okay, you'll be Lenin, you'll be Bukharin, you'll be Trotsky, you'll be such and such and such. And they would try to defend the opinion of that particular history character. Mm. And somebody, um, wrote, I don't know, to the Ministry of uh, Inside Matters, claiming that by doing that, they actually proclaim. Uh, uh, they actually opening their own ideas and they showing their own and real political beliefs. And one day, my grandfather and he wasn't married back then yet. He was just a young kid. He was uh, he was renting this little uh, room in a big barrack and uh, it was uh, surrounded by fans. And uh, one day he was entering through the gate, and when he was inside the front yard, he saw the janitor of the building carrying his books. So he knew that uh, something is going to happen, and he just turned around, left Moscow, and just hide it. And um, the interesting thing is my grandma told me that somewhere in the 70s, uh, her and, uh, no, not the 70s, what I'm talking about, he died in 1968. So somewhere before 1968, uh, her and my grandfather entered one of the train in underground in Moscow, and it was a guy 
She said he was white as a snow was there and uh, him and my grandfather looked at each other and just hugged and started to cry. It was one of the guys who, they recognized each other, it was one of the guys from the same school who actually didn't escape and he made his years in, in a camp in Siberia. He was arrested. So could you show us a few of these other photos that you have? Oh, yeah, there are lots of them. <laughs> like this one is, the, is my grandmother family from my father's side. Everything I, I talked before, it was about my, my mother's side. But this is my, my father's side, and this is my grandmother. And uh, this is, Sister, oh yeah, <laughs> um, this is my grandmother, and uh, this is my grand grandfather. And I believe, uh, as I told you earlier, he was the consultant for Lenin's library for Hebrew literature. And uh, this is my grandmother and my grandfather and my dad. Oh. Yeah, and given that my dad was born in 1938, so I assume it's right before the war. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather um, was, uh, I don't remember what he did actually, but he worked for, he built one of the big, uh, one of the big bridges in Moscow, and uh, uh, it's near, it's called Krimsky Bridge, and it's near the big theme park, not like, a fun park in Moscow and I remember when we would go to this park my dad would always mention that remember your your grandfather <laughs> built it <laughs> and um, my father's family his grand grandma was um, how do I say it well some somehow she was uh, relatively high in the Soviet uh, Union government. So my grandma, um, so they were kind of privileged communists, whatever it was. So this picture is, I'll have to read it because I, I don't, you know, I don't know what uh, all the names, but I'll take this. Uh, this picture is the school. Oh, really uh -huh. like to read it uh, well, I'll kind of have to. Yeah, I can hold okay. it. It's like reading and looking. Yeah. This picture is. It's the. Uh, it's 1927 or 1928. And this is the elementary school, where only the kids of high authority Soviet Union government would go to. Mm. So, uh, second road on the right. Second row on the right. This is, uh, okay, how did, how yeah. do they count? Second so row this from is the top or the bottom? Yeah, mm. okay, let's see. Well, there's sort of three rows, uh, roughly. Второй ряд справа. Okay, so, okay. First one supposed to be a girl. So second row on the right. It's a girl? Yes, it is the girl. So actually, this is daughter of Sverdlov. That was like a uh, very, very famous mm -hmm. uh, guy in, uh, in the Soviet uh, government. And third one, no, she is, yes, yeah, she's the first one. So here, wait. I'm just trying to figure it out. No, my my, gra my grandma's brother is supposed to be the third. No, could be him. Second, maybe you know <laughs> what? Maybe it. Yes, that's him. Oh. So second row on the right. So this is Svetlov's daughter. She probably was a teacher or something. I can't say anything because then okay that's easy yes that they count this is a second row yeah so this is uh, 
the, yeah, so let's say that she is Sverdlov's daughter, and this is my grand grandfather. Uh, no, he is my grandmother's brother, and he uh, his name was Matthew, and um, I guess he was very gifted. He graduated high school when he was fourteen, and he started uh, Moscow University very early, and then the war broke. And uh, being a student of university, I guess it was when he was on his third year or something, uh, being a student in university, he didn't have to go to the front line. But um, he decided that he wants to go. And it was what's called Narodne Apalchenie. It's not a regular army. Even they had like the commanders and officers but they were not trained troops and they didn't really have enough ammunition. It was probably like one gun for four people or ten people, I don't mm. know how it was. And um, he, he died. So how did um, your family, this, is, this was a school for, for you said, sort of the um, yeah, more well-off yes. communists. I suppose, yeah. so, so how did your family, you know, have access to this? Uh, well, it was because my grand-grandmother, somehow she got up in the government. Uh -huh. uh, not high enough, you know, so her name is somewhere. But somewhere in this rank she worked for the government. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, she, you know, it was good that she wasn't... Um, That's right. Okay, it's good that she wasn't high enough probably that helped her to survive all these years, you know, when lots of the officials were arrested. She, she didn't get arrested. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the thing back then, I believe, that for lots of people who worked in this government, they, they worked there not for privileges or anything, but really for the idea. They still believe in communism, they still believe in this labor, may, whatever, freedom. And, um, so they, ne they didn't really use the privileges. Like when the war broke, my grandmother was um, evacuated to Turkmenistan or Tajikistan, I believe it was Turkmenistan, with, uh, with my father. So her husband was drafted to the front line mm -hmm. and they immigrated and she also had my aunt who was just a baby. And her education was geology, uh, and uh, she worked is, uh, as a mark shader on mines. You know what mark shader is? It's um, it's geologist who's like decides, uh, actually in charge of the mine. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember what they were actually getting from the mines she was working for, but. What happened is that, that the mines were very old. And you know, when they get the minerals or whatever it's called, they get from the, from the mine, they have to leave columns to support. The, back then, they didn't build the structure there. They, just, they would leave columns of the natural stuff to support the ceiling so they could go farther. But the mines were almost... Uh, Everything was taken out of it, but the country needed it for the war. So her job at one point was to go back in and decide what column could be taken down, uh, not to collapse on everybody who was there. It's an important job. It's just yeah. Kind of, yeah, and she was, she was, I can't find her old pictures. But that's prob probably how she looked back then, and mm -hmm. she, mm, uh, so she had a baby, and she had my father, who was three, four years old, and he stayed with a local woman, and um, she spent all her day, on her, all her working day underground, and she said that um, somebody would bring her baby on a horse and would yell down the mine, tell Joel tell Mark Shader or tell geologist, she was the only educated person there, so tell geologist we brought the baby to eat. 
So she would come up, breastfeed the baby, and wow. go down <laughs> to the mine, and the baby would be taken back to the village. And when she came after the end, then my, uh, that's, that's my grandfather, your husband, mm. and um, yeah, this is 1944. And uh, he got killed in 1943. And she, I remember her telling me that she just ran to the, it was how to prairie, prairie area. Mm -hmm. She just ran to the prairie to scream and cry. And um, after uh, when the war ended, she, she returned to Moscow and um, worked as a geologist for the Ministry of Geology in Moscow. And uh, my mother's grandfather, the one who fled to Moscow after he realized that uh, the people are waiting for him, he was never able to get an education because uh, even he was... Uh, talented and gifted and really wanted to get education, but he was never being able to do it because he was afraid to submit papers anywhere because then he would be discovered. Mm. Let's take a quick break. Mm -hmm. so I can This is part B, um, a continuation of the interview with Ina Schneiden. My name is Emily Schuster, and Brandon Springer is filming. So, Ina, you have some other pictures up here. Uh, yeah, so That's these seven. three pictures, uh, we, can, we can move this one. These three pictures are of my grandfather from my mom's side. And uh, both my grandfathers uh, went to the war, and uh, one of them came back, another one was killed. And um, my mother's father, he made it to Germany. And I really don't know those pictures are taken during the war or after he came back. But uh, this one is my father. Well, I can't find him here, but I guess it's just a very nice picture. These are the pictures of the front line. And somewhere here is my grandfather. Mm. And, and this was in 1943. Nine, I, think this I would sure. I would think it was yeah. 1943. Okay. Yes. And um, don't know too much. Oh, this is my father's. Mm. That was un, after the war already. When um, so this is my grandmother. The one who, as I told you, was a Mark Shader, that was after she already returned back to Moscow. This is her daughter, my aunt, and this is my dad. Mm. This is uh, her mom. This is her sister. A beautiful family. Yeah, you know, if you look at those faces, like old pictures, they're really something. Oh, yeah. this is... Um, um, you remember I told you about this guy on the picture with lots of kids, the one who was admitted to university when he was 14. So he was like, I understood he was like the love of the family, like every, I'm not sure, he probably wasn't the youngest one, but they just adored him all and I guess that's, that's him. No, he, he obviously wasn't the youngest one, but somehow the, like my grandma, last time I saw her, she was in her 70s and she still, when she talks about him, even he died like 40 years before, she would always use his childhood nickname when she would talk about him. What was that nickname? Huh? What was the nickname? It was, uh, well, his name is Matthew and they called him Matunchik. Mm. Yeah, and my cousin actually, who lives in Vermont, um, she's from my father's side. He, uh, she is a daughter of my father's sister, and uh, they called uh, her oldest son, uh, his name of Matthew, in honor of, uh, what is it, uh, remote grandfather or something. Yeah, and um, this is, uh, what is that? Oh, it is 1940. It's when Matthew and his uh, 
and students uh, from the university. So it was like right before the right before the war. When he was in school, this is in this university, is him with uh -huh. friends yeah. from school or something like that. And you know, I'm thinking. So it was university, but somehow they look the people them look much older than the kids who went to mm. university now. I don't know whether they're really older or they simply just matured earlier. What wouldn't surprise me too. Yeah. You know, there are some beautiful pictures here with beautiful faces, but yeah. I don't know who they are. And I'm, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure that my mom would know. No, but just old pictures. Were your parents alive during World War II? Uh, my mom was born in 1940, mm -hmm. and uh, my uh, father was born in 1938. Yeah. So, did they have any memories of the war? No, I don't think so. I mean. Mom was five years old when the, the war ended. The only thing she remembers, but I think, I'm not even sure that she remembers it. I think she was telling it to me um, uh, because my grandma told her. So as I said, they were in Turkmenistan or Tajikistan for evacuation, but they didn't move back to Moscow right away when the war ended. And my mom was, as a child, she was very sick. It was pneumonia or some, you know, like respiratory disease she got. And uh, there were not enough medications. It was not enough food. It was not enough of anything. So my grandma really struggled, you know, for this child to survive. And after the war, she met one of the nurses from the drugstore. And uh, they were talking, they were not friends. They just recognized each other. They were talking and all of a sudden the nurse said, you know, life is harder now. Because during the war I could speculate with medications. And now I can't do it any longer. And my mom said that grandma just turned around without saying anything and left because, you know, it's like almost that this woman cost her, almost cost her child to die. Because the regulations for uh, well, the she simply were you know were strict. Uh, no. The thing is that uh, she nobody was actually there to control yeah, her, yeah, so she would got medication, uh -huh. but she wouldn't put it for the open trade, open sale. She would uh, sell it under the on the black market mm -hmm. or under the table mm -hmm. and would charge more. Yeah. But uh, the people who like my grandma, who were given I don't know two days to get their belongings and move, they really didn't have money. Mm -hmm. No, not really. I don't remember any, any yeah. them so, telling anything. So to go back, a while ago you were telling us about the process of applying for a visa um, and that your husband had sued the government, essentially, mm -hmm. um, for not allowing him to leave. Um, that's sort of where we left off. Would you like to continue that story? Well, there is not too much to continue because somewhere in the middle, when we already had the when we were allowed to leave Russia, uh, no, when U.S. said that they would take us, at that time, uh, Russia separated. It was this um, Belovezhskaya push or something, I don't remember what it was, but somehow Soviet Union collapsed. It was after the, uh, the putsch, or whatever, whatever it's called. And uh, so Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, it just happened very fast, you know, like, uh, who was the president in 1990 here, 1991? I guess George it was, H. W. Bush. yeah, I think it was Bush father, yes. And um, uh, our family got on a list of the people who were not allowed to leave Russia, at least that's what I was told by my husband. And again, I was too busy with two babies to pay any attention. So he said that our family got on a list that Bush gave to Yeltsin or Gorbachev, I believe Yeltsin it was back then. Mm, uh, as, uh, so you let these people out and we do something for you. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you know, very, very fast, yeah. we, got we got permission to leave and we already had permission to come here. 
So this uh, court deal didn't actually go anywhere. And I'm sorry, what was your husband's name? Uh, Vitaly Weisberg. Okay. Um, and so you got the visas and um, you decided to come to the States. And did you come directly to Boulder? Mm-hmm. And yeah. And did you choose that because your husband... Uh, you? you know, the thing was that we had only... Uh, Yes, I remember. It was 18 years ago. Uh, I guess our only options were to go, to come to Boulder because of the family, to go to New York, simply because New York took everybody, and to go to San Francisco, also because San Francisco took everybody and we had some family there. Mm -hmm. And me and my former husband decided that we really don't want to live with the big Russian community around us. You did not? You did, we did not. Okay. So, and Boulder sounded like a good place. And we had family here, so we came. Mm -hmm. And what was your last night like in the Soviet Union? You know, I didn't worry at all. I guess it was just too... <laughs> it was funny, it was like two weeks. No, it was one week before we were supposed to leave. We had a car. And it was parked under the under our windows. We lived on a, like uh, it was a nine stores apartment building. We lived on a third floor, and the car was parked right uh, outside the windows. And the crime was on a rise back then in Russia. Like it was pretty scary. And uh, so we had the security system on the car. And all of a sudden, at 11 o'clock at night, our, star, our car started to make the noise, like somebody was trying to break it. Break it. And um, my, my husband just, you know, jumped out. He wasn't dressed. It was September. And September in Moscow, it was like late September. It, it's pretty cold. And uh, so he jumped out. And he's not coming back. He's not coming back for like two minutes, five minutes. So I start to worry. I look outside. The car is gone. And I started to think, what the hell I'm going to do with two kids and uh, all prepared to leave? Should I go? Should I stay? What, what, what should I do? He comes back like in half an hour. What happened is that we had this uh, reckless drivers living in our apartment building. So they were just speeding on the front yard and they hit the car. So he jumped out and he tried to follow them because they damaged the car that was already sold. Oh, no. So he tried to, to follow them, but they turned into some alley and turned the lights off and it was dark, so he couldn't find them. But I, I was worried sick. Yeah, I bet that felt like longer than half an hour. Yeah, probably. You, really... you know, maybe it was 15 minutes, but it yeah. felt like half an hour, yeah. you know, but I, I remember I was so scared. Wow. So I remember this. Another thing I remember is that to uh, we had to, uh, I don't remember, did we ever use them? Probably we did, because kids were so little. Uh, I was trying to gather all the medical information, you know, of the kids, all the immunizations, all, everything, everything. And I went to, to the children's clinic where our pediatrician was to get these papers. And he, the bus is there. I don't know what was the deal. Was it enough, not enough bus drivers, not enough gas, not enough buses? I remember standing there with all these papers and waiting for the bus for probably for an hour or hour and a half. And then I decided that, okay, I'll get on another bus and then I would have to walk just uh, two blocks or three blocks. I believe it was three blocks to, to our house. And, uh, but it all already was like seven o'clock at night and it was pitch black and uh, like nobody was in control or nobody cared. There were no lights on the street and this uh, place where we lived, it was pretty old district with lots of trees and one of the block, it was actually a school, but school that was, sur was surrounded with a big orchard. So that actually just added uh, the darkness to the street because all these trees and in September they didn't lose all their leaves yet. So it was pretty dark and scary and you know I remember the very, somehow it was very calm feeling that I may not make it 
to the house. I, I may not make it home. Simply because the crime was so high, it was not the best district of Moscow, and it was so dark. So, and I know that if I would yell, nobody would jump out of the nearest buildings to save me. And then I heard that somebody was walking behind me, and I looked around, and it was a guy. So I did the only thing I could think about is that I stopped, and I came straight to him. And I said, you know, I'm so sorry, but, and I was 24 years old, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm so scared. Can I just walk next to you? And he said, yeah, that's fine. Where do you live? I said, well, it's over there. And he just walked me to, my, uh, to the entrance to my building. <laughs> and then the funny thing is that then we moved here, and um, I remember at uh, 10 o'clock at night, for some reason, I felt like I want some chocolate. And we didn't have a car yet. It was probably our first two weeks or first months here. And my husband said, well, OK, it's warm. Let's just put kids on a stroller and walk to the supermarket and get you some chocolate. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite different. Very different. Yeah, wow. That's a great little snapshot of yeah. that it was different. Um, so what was your first day? You know, we, uh, we came like at 10 o'clock at night because it was some mess with the flights. Uh, so we came at 10 o'clock at night and it was uh, Stapleton, the old airport. And uh, it was my husband, my youngest son, my oldest son, me. Plus, uh, his uh, parents were already here, his brother and his uh, wife and the daughter, they were already here. Plus, uh, people from uh, Jewish community in Boulder came to greet us. So there were lots of people. And we got separated in cars. So I was driving with my uh, brother-in-law uh, and my youngest son, who was seven months old. And we are coming from the Stapleton Airport, and the way he took us was through the Commerce City, and it stinks, and it stinked back then too. And you know, I looked at the lights and the stink, and I, th and I just imagined that we are going to live somewhere near the stinking factory, and this little, <laughs> little house, you know, kind of jumped to the fence of the factory, you know, I, it was kind of scary. But then we left the city, it was pretty dark, so I couldn't see much. And when we were passing Louisville Hill, my, uh, my brother-in-law told me, you know, I always feel sorry when I bring people from the airport at night, because it's a magnific magnificent view, and you're kind of missing it. Mm -hmm. So we came, and uh, we stayed with my uh, parents-in-law, and they lived... Uh, not in downtown Boulder, but in a, they were renting a place, but like in the middle of Boulder. And the way the building was uh, located is that when you exit the building, it was only one exit, when you exit the building, the mountains are behind you. So I, <laughs> I remember... Uh, I was, you know, everybody tried to scare me of the time change and how we are going to feel it. And I woke up at 7 in the morning, kids slept great, and I wake up because my grandmother, oh, not my grandmother, my mother-in-law tells my husband, he said that he wants to drink something, and she tells him, well, there is Coca-Cola in the fridge. And just... Hearing my mother-in-law saying, there is Coca-Cola in the fridge, it was, for some reason, it was hilarious. Yeah. It was so funny. So I got up, kids already ate, beautiful sunny day. Um, so, and my father-in-law said, okay, let's go, I'll show you university, it's beautiful. Okay, so we got dressed, get the kids ready, leaving the house, leaving the building, and I turn around, and I see... You know, cloudless blue sky and the mountains. It was breathtaking. For, for a while, probably for first month or two, I felt like 
it's a decoration, like theater background. <laughs> and somebody finally would tell me that, okay, you had enough, just get your ass out. Yeah. I was, you know, it was like no reason, but I was so afraid that I'm going to be kicked out for whatever. But yeah, I, I still remember how it looked when you know all of a sudden you turn around and those beautiful mountains are in front of you. Um, are there um, are there other comparisons to life? I mean, I obviously it was very geographically <laughs> different and and. Well, you know, it's really I, I can't really remember what was the comparison to. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, back then, I, I know I was told that uh, my uh, mother-in-law started to cry when she went to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I was kind of prepared for this, so I didn't cry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the difference is, obviously, it wasn't back then. But what I remember it, uh, what I remember probably was my second year there, here, is that uh, when I went to pick up my, my kids from kindergarten, from preschool, uh, they have these little cubbies with the name of the kids. And I just looked at, to all these different names, like different last names, where sometimes you can say the origin from where the family is from. Sometimes I couldn't, but just the feeling that there are like 20 kids in class and you can, you know, their families came from different places and different backgrounds really made me feel very good. Yeah. And um, another thing is that growing up in this, in that part of Moscow, when I was old enough to notice, I noticed that it was probably every day I would witness a fight, like a fist fight between school kids. And uh, my both kids went, like they're both in universities now and they went to school here, and I never seen one fight. Did, did they go to Boulder High? They, no, uh, well, no, they um, they went uh, for like for high school. They went to Fairview. Mm -hmm. I still believe in standardized testing, and yeah. it looks like Fairview does good yeah. with scores. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you um, engage with the uh, Jewish community in Boulder? Mm, not as much as I wanted, but probably because, you know, first you try to adapt to new life and it takes, it takes all your energy and plus, uh, you know, little kids and I wasn't, I didn't know how to drive and um, my husband wasn't able to find a job for a long time and I found just, you know, like I took whatever I could and it was the teacher position in preschool, so it was between working and two little kids working so, with little kids yeah you know and uh, my own children and uh, all the home stuff so mm -hmm. i would probably you know if the life wouldn't be so hectic i would love to be more involved but it simply wasn't enough energy mm -hmm. so did you have any interaction with the jewish community we would go to holidays or uh, we would go to synagogue we would go to some social events but uh, nothing particular. What were the uh, what were the holidays and going to synagogue like? So how did it differ going to synagogue in Boulder? Uh, I never went to, you know, I probably went just once in synagogue in Moscow and simply because the guy from Ishiva wanted to date me. <laughs> and he told me that, I said that, hey, I want to get matzah, but there is a huge line. <laughs> and he said, okay, come tomorrow, I'll leave it on the second floor. Probably it was the only time yeah. when I stepped my foot in the synagogue in Moscow. So that was my first synagogue. Yeah. And what was that experience like in Boulder? How did it feel going to synagogue in Boulder? Very foreign, you know, like because it was something new. Then it grew up into you, but... Uh, well, it, was, it felt like, well, I'll learn. And uh, I just want to know what it is, and I'll learn. Did you? Um, not as, again, not as much as I wanted, but they were, uh, I never became too religion. As my husband said, he's an atheist, or agnostic, whatever, still, I didn't figure out. And I think it's the best combination, you know, like, I can't imagine both of us being different faiths, 
when one is kind of believer, another can be agnostic or atheist. I feel it's like the best. Mm -hmm. He he grew up as a Protestant, and um, uh, so he he tells me that you have your own little religion. It's not really Judaism. He says that about you? Yeah. Oh. And, you know, probably he's right because, you know, I would say I eat uh, shrimp, I eat uh, seafood, I eat uh, pork, you know. So I, I wouldn't say I fast on uh, Yom Kippur, I don't eat bread during Passover. For the main holidays, I go to synagogue. Both my kids uh, had bar mitzvah. And uh, there were some periods of my life when I felt like. I need to go to synagogue. Uh, just, uh, it's kind of unexplainable. It's uh, more like I was in a hard situation, and I felt like when I go there, I started to feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like for example, before my divorce, I would go to synagogue every Friday, just just to be there. Mm -hmm. So, do you see your Jewish identity as having changed once you came to Boulder? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't really much of Jewish identity when I was in Russia because what I think all my Jewish identity in Russia was because I felt like they don't want me, because they see me as different, you know. I was seven years old, I wasn't ready to be different. I wanted to blend in, I wanted to have friends and I, you know, I felt like from the kindergarten I felt like just everybody else. Then all of a sudden somebody tells me, well, you're not like us, you're not like everybody else, you're different. So I believe all my Jewish identity in Russia was built on this kind of rebellion thing. That, okay, I don't want to be like you to start with. And I remember this feeling, you know, like when we were living in Russia, it was huge lines to get gas on the gas station. And, you know, two days before we left, I remember we were in the car waiting for the gas, and I was thinking, you know what, I'm out of here. You can have your gas, you can have your salami, you can have whatever you want. I just don't care at all. And I hope you'll be all better without me. So. I have one other question that oh. is a not totally related to what we've recently been talking about, but um, when did you learn to speak English and, and where? Uh, I took it in school, and again, it was just a regular public school. It wasn't a mm -hmm. language school, like we ha they were language school in Russia, but this was just a public school, and um, I just, well, my English is not perfect, but I had, I had, a, I had this teacher, she, she, she was wonderful, and uh, that's the one person that I feel like uh, sorry that I lost in touch with her. I, I never seen her after I graduated from high school, but it was interesting because we were so scared of her. Like, it was the only class where kids would actually not run and play on the, on the break, but stay and read the textbooks <laughs> or compare the notes and stuff. And um, usually somewhere in class, because we did, not all of us had watches, so we, but we knew who had watches. And you would turn, and in Russia the grades go from, well, one was the boss, but no teacher would ever give you one. So it was two, what was very bad, and five, what was really good. So I remember that my, uh, the girl who was sitting next to me, the girl from, from the desk in front of us would turn around and said, and she had a watch, the one who was next to me. Uh, so the girl from uh, the desk in front of us would turn around and said, hey, how long it is till the class is ending? And my friend would say, five minutes. And she would say, okay, that's enough for her to put like five twos in her journal. <sighs> she, was, she was very strict. But she was she was very good. She was very smart. Very she would very sarcastic. Like she would not hesitate to, to almost not offend you, but to to humiliate you in front of class. But it was this hate and love situation. We ha we hated her, but we, we loved her. And uh, the last thing I heard is that she immigrated to Israel, and uh, that was the last what I know about her. Mm -hmm. And. Um, 
uh, when I was in fifth grade, uh, I had some stomach problems. Well, they were going for a long time, but uh, though my uh, doctor told my mom that it would be better if I go to specialized boarding school outside of Moscow, where it was the special uh, like boarding school for the kids with uh, digestional problems, um, it's like special diet, uh, doctor, medicine and stuff, just for like for a year. So I went there and so they took a good care of our health. Uh, the educational level there wasn't as good. So when I came back to school, especially I felt it with English, I didn't know as much as my classmates would know. And I remember that my uh, grandma went to school to talk to my English teacher after I made few pretty bad grades there. And my English teacher told her, you know, I'll give you a phone number for this lady. She used to be my student. Uh, she works as private tutor now because you have to have in a no English. She will need it. And, you know, I remember my mom and my grandma kind of laughing at this. She will need it because in our situation, it could only mean that she will be out of Russia at some point of her life. So she'll need English. Mm. So, so I took five years in school of English. Then I had uh, four years in uh, college of English. And just before we left, uh, me and my husband, we had like private tutor because he forgot all the language. He, he was 17 years older than me, so he forgot all the language he took in college. So we just had private tutor, we would go every day. Mm -hmm. And your kids were too young. Yeah, they you were, were too young. Yeah. To really yeah, you know, yeah. he didn't even speak Russian back then. So. Yeah. <laughs> and what was the process like for them coming to the States? I mean, what was the. For kids? Yeah, I mean, how, how did they adapt? Uh, you know, honestly, I think it wasn't not a big difference for them than going to country house from Moscow. It just took a little longer. Mm -hmm. But uh, the flight we took, uh, I believe this company went bankruptcy or something like this, a tower airline. Yeah, they, they, they got bankruptcy like years and years ago. But um, they had this shut, um, how do you call it, shuttle flights like Moscow, New York, Moscow, New York. And when, uh, this is actually the picture, I just saw this. It was a picture from the airport. It's kind of funny. If I can find it, I will not look there, but maybe it is here. And um, so, um, what I was saying? I'm sorry. You were talking, there's a picture from the airport? Oh, yeah. So, uh, this uh, flight was specifically for people with um, some medical conditions. They had a med uh, doctor and nurse on the flight. That was just by coincidence that you uh, were on this flight? No, 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 because uh, we had two little kids. One was seven months old, so they decided that we would be at better off on this flight. But what it turned out is that um, the flight was late and somehow because of the weather or because of something else, they, didn't, uh, they were not allowed to... Oh, this is my grandma, mm. the, one who, the one who was born in Australia. She looks like you. You think that's her? Yeah. Really? I was said she looks more like my, my sister, but okay, that's him. She was very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, they, they couldn't stop at the, I believe it was somewhere in Belgium, Brussels, whatever. They were supposed to get um, benzene, uh, not benzene, what do they put? Kerosene, right? Uh, supposed to get kerosene and food. No, you can find it somewhere in the box. Uh, but uh, because of the weather or timing or whatever, they were not allowed to stop in Brussels. Or what, I don't remember where they were. So they had to stop in Paris, Paris. And Paris authority told them that we can give you kerosene, but no food. 
So it was all this flight with like people with diabetes, old people, kids and stuff without food for the whatever it was, 12 hours flight across the Atlantic. So they survive on like orange juice and peanuts. And my younger one, no, I want to find the picture. And not my, uh, my younger one was okay because he was breastfeeding and I had a couple jars of uh, baby food. So he was okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, my older one, he was just damn cute. <laughs> he had big blue eyes, uh, rosy cheeks. He was kind of, you know, like a fat baby. Not really fat, but like big baby. And he uh, long, I, I refused to cut his um, hair. He was two years old. And so he had this blonde, believe it or not, he had Aww. blonde curls. So he would just go and walk around and I, I felt like I can't strain him. If he wants to walk around the plane, he is going to. Otherwise, I will go nuts. <laughs> so I, 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 I let him to go and he would simply go to the uh, flight attendant. Just look at them because he wasn't talking much and they wouldn't understand him probably anyway. And, and uh, he would come back with some food. You know, chocolate or something. <laughs> no, I can't. can't. Can't find it. No, well. So, uh, and then we came to US and uh, our friends, the ones who immigrated like a year before us, they met us at the airport because of all this mess with the flight, um, we, we missed our connection flight. So we we stayed in New York airport for probably like, we had to move, I don't remember what one we arrived. We either arrived to LaGuardia and had to go to Canada or we came to Canada and had to go mm -hmm. to LaGuardia. But we had to take the bus and our friends were there so they helped us. And uh, uh, again, we just, you know, it. I, I still remember going because I had a I had this, no, my younger one, he was in a kangaroo carrier. And for older one, we had the stroller, but we also had bags, so we didn't have too much, you know, too many hands. And I remember my two years old, he was like, you know, he was so serious and he was, that's him actually. Not a good Aww. picture, I had, a, I had a colorful one somewhere, but I don't remember where. So that that's actually in Moscow, but probably he is like, that's well it's you know what it's no he's um it's a year before we moved here well anyway so we uh so we finally came to the airport where we were supposed to sit and uh, he was so serious he was pushing his own stroller and i still remember going to this going downstairs whatever it was and they were tourniquets and there were all these, you know, people who were waiting for their relatives coming from Moscow. And I remember, I you know, and I was crazy because I didn't sleep at all. And uh, so everything was kind of cloudy. But then I turn around and I see Leonia carrying a bag of popcorn from, from whenever he got it. So somebody probably just gave it to him. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> And so we spent like, I don't know, six hours in the airport waiting for the flight and uh, then we got on the flight and came here, came to Denver. What, are, what interactions did you have with Boulder Action for Soviet Jewry? Well, I remember, I remember the interview we gave. It was just a couple months after we came and the interview was by, I believe the person who took care of us was Karen Watkins or Carol, Carol Watkins, I believe. And uh, her daughter was doing some, I don't know what class she was taking or whatever, but again, she had to interview uh, people who came, so she came. Uh, and also, I guess the custom was to find a family who are semi-similar to the people who come, so they would help to adopt and uh, our family was with the same age kids, two boys, 
and they, they helped us a lot because uh, first we didn't have a car and then my husband, I didn't know how to drive but my husband had to learn all the American regulations and then you know while we didn't have a license, he didn't have license but then we didn't have a car. So they, uh, this lady helped us around you know driving to all the doctor's appointments and, and stuff. And then I remember it was Rabbi Rose in the synagogue. I believe he is an uncle of the Rabbi Rose in Hagashem now. And he had like this um, meeting in his house for the new members. And uh, I remember we met one family there. He was also from Russia, but they came two years before that. And they just moved here from another state in two years. God, it sounded like a lifetime, you know, so much experience. And um, their youngest son was the same age as our oldest one. And uh, interesting enough, years later, they had a bar mitzvah together. <laughs> <laughs> in which family was that? Uh, that was Bigelman, Bigelman family. Mm. And uh, was it with Rabbi Rose that he was Rabbi Rose? Yes, but not the present Rabbi Rose. I believe it was his uncle. And so, how long were you working with Boulder Ash for Soviet Jewry? Like, how, how long were they helping you? You know, the thing is that I, I feel like I remember contacts with them, you know, here and there probably for a year, maybe longer. It's never felt like, okay, you are you're on your own now. It always felt like, well, we can always call them and ask something if we need help. And, you know, I feel like at some point we just felt like, well, we don't need help anymore. But it was never like a border. Okay, from now on we are not calling. Mm -hmm. And are you still in contact with any of those? Uh, well, always a pleasure to see uh, Bill Cohen in, in synagogue. I, I still remember when he came to Moscow and we met, we went to this art market and uh, it was fun, I remember this. And, uh, you know, I, another thing I remember is that we went to, uh, we went for lunch in some little Moscow restaurant and then we tried to, it was Bill Cohen, uh, my husband and myself, and um, we tried to get a taxi. And somehow Bill was, I don't know, 100 meters from us. When I think back then, about back then, it's just easy to manipulate with meters. So probably 150 meters, something like this, like he was not next to us. And we all... I'm so sorry. That's okay. Uh, and uh, we were trying to catch a cab, and all of a sudden, Bill uh, whistled, like, you know, like mm -hmm. this. And it was so loud that I don't ever think that I ever heard it before. And I remember, I was like, so surprised, and I told him, I don't remember what I said exactly, but the meaning was like, wow, I'm so surprised you can do it. <laughs> and he said, I grew up in New York or something like that. Another thing I remember that my husband told me that it is a lawyer from Boulder who will call. So just get his phone number so I can call him when I come home. And of course Bill calls and he's trying to give me the phone number. The problem was that my English was only what they taught me in school and uh, college. And zero is a zero. That's the only way you say it. And he was saying none. Or something, how, how else can you say zero? Uh, there is something. Yeah. Nothing. He was using none, could it be? He was using another word. He was not saying zero. Oh, oh, oh that's right. Yeah. He was saying oh. And I could not understand it. Like all the numbers I got right. Yeah, because O is a letter. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And O, what, the, what is O? And I was like trying to count, you know, what number am I <laughs> missing, what I don't remember. Finally, I got it. <laughs> and he probably didn't understand what I don't mm -hmm. understand. Yeah, yeah that's, it was O too. That's right. 
So overall, what were your impressions of BASJ and the Boulder Jewish community when you arrived? You know, just I felt very welcoming, I guess, you know, welcome by them. And, you know, I, I still remember Carol greeting us at the airport with this bouquet of flowers. You know, that um, it's funny because I have more friends in Russia now than compared to when I lived there. And, um, well, thank you for internet. And, uh, of course, you know, it's uh, hard for somebody who lives there, imagine that I have no nostalgia. Not at all. I mean, for this 18 years, not for a split second, I thought that maybe it was a mistake. And um, they don't want to believe it. And the thing is that what I'm telling them, I feel home here. And I don't care what, what people think about it, you know, that, I don't know, my neighbor may feel that I'm just the immigrant who came here and took your, took your spot. You know, I really don't, I don't care if somebody thinks about things like this, because I feel home. And uh, I never felt home back there. Back there. And I believe uh, those kind of feelings, uh, what really affects them as the very first, maybe months, that you spend in a new place. And uh, I felt like, yes, this is hard. We'll have to walk and we'll have to learn how to live here. But I felt home. I don't have any other questions. I don't either. Do you have any okay. other stories, memories you'd like to share? No, probably when you leave, I'll be like, <laughs> ah! Give us a call. Yeah, but no, not really. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, oh, you're you. welcome. You're welcome.